Welcome to NJ Law, the program designed to inform and educate you about the inner workings of our criminal justice system, allowing you to speak directly to New Jersey law enforcement officials who make the decisions in our two-county area. Your host, Detective Sergeant Kevin Quinn of the Township of Ocean Police Department, is an 11-year veteran police officer. He has taught at the Monmouth County Police Academy and has lectured at Monmouth College and Brookdale College. Good evening, I'm Sergeant Kevin Quinn of the Township of Ocean Police. Welcome to NJ Law. If you uh, have any questions tonight about seatbelt and airbag safety, it's, it's something we're going to be talking about as well as many other subjects related to traffic enforcement. Stay tuned here to TV 34 for NJ Law. Our number here in the studio is 681-3330. That's 681-3330. Uh, this is interactive television, folks, so we'd like you to uh, give us a call. Uh, ask any questions you might, and if you want to hear something discussed in particular, we'd be glad to do it for you. Tonight I have uh, three guests who certainly uh, are knowledgeable in, uh, in the area of seatbelt and uh, airbag safety. To my immediate left is Trooper Larry Honey of the New Jersey State Police. He's assigned to their traffic bureau, but apparently now he's on a special assignment to the Division of Highway Traffic Safety. I hope I got all that right. And uh, to his immediate left is Patrolman Michael Rezator, who uh, was a guest here last time, uh, didn't get to say enough about seatbelts, <laughs> so he's back. He's from the Ocean Township Police Department uh, and our Traffic Safety uh, Bureau. And to his immediate left is uh, Patrolman Joe Fury. He's from the Howell Township Police Department, uh, very local here, and he's also with their Traffic Safety uh, Division. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking time to come down. Uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, so you folks understand a little bit about how uh, the traffic divisions and in the, in the various organizations work. And maybe we can start uh, with Trooper Honey. Maybe you could explain a little bit about how your traffic division uh, works in the state police. Well, the state police traffic bureau is responsible for all traffic functions within the division of state police. Some of the things that we're, we participate in are breath test coordination, fatal accident investigations, heavy truck enforcement, uh, tactical patrol units and uh, my position or my uh, program within the traffic bureau is occupant protection training occupant protection being uh, safety belts airbags and child safety seats and essentially I teach a two-day a 16-hour program to uh, other police officers and certify them as safety belt instructors now Larry do you uh, do you do you uh, wander around the whole state? Do you find yourself going to different areas, or are you kind of locked into a specific uh, Oh, absolutely. Area? I, uh, I travel throughout the entire state of New Jersey, uh, providing training programs uh, on a county-to-county -county basis. Uh, this week, I happen to be at the State Police Academy in Seagirt, and we're training 32 municipal police officers from all over New Jersey. And uh, you mentioned the, the different uh, the units, the TAC pack and the uh, heavy truck enforcement. Uh, a few years back, uh, and maybe the folks at home don't realize that, uh, the division of uh, motor vehicles or the motor vehicle inspectors kind of melded with the state police. Uh, maybe you could explain a little bit about that. And yes, the uh, division of motor vehicle at one time had their own group of uh, highway patrolmen, motor vehicle inspectors. Uh, they were merged into the state police. I believe there were 120 highway patrolmen. They were merged in. Uh, they didn't necessarily go to the traffic bureau. They were sent to road stations and various assignments throughout the Division of State Police. And do they continue uh, uh, doing a lot of truck safety inspections and things that they did before, or, do, or are they just having varied tasks? Well, the motor vehicle uh, inspectors aren't necessarily, which are now troopers, aren't necessarily performing heavy truck enforcement, but I should say that the State Police has a, a very big heavy truck enforcement program, consists of commercial vehicle inspections, way teams, hazardous uh, vehicle inspections, hazardous materials vehicles inspections. So uh, it's a pretty big program. And uh, folks traveling up and down the, uh, the parkway, the turnpike, uh, whatever, I'm, I'm, I know whenever I'm in a car with, uh, with, a, with a pile of youngsters, they usually ask, you know, what's going on over here, what's going on over there, uh, because uh, they might know you're a police officer and then they figure you know all the answers. And, uh, a lot of times along, let's say, the parkway, you'll see a, a little platform with a couple of guys standing there and there, and they've got a couple of uh, trucks pulled over. Uh, is, that, uh, is that that type of inspection? Yes. The, the truck enforcement unit has portable scales. 
uh, that they carry in the back of their patrol vehicles, which are usually vans. Uh, they can do roadside uh, uh, weighing. Uh, they also do inspections, brake inspections, and vehicle safety inspections for tires and brakes and, and other various safety equipment to make sure that the trucks that are out there on the highways are, in fact, safe. Especially as many accidents as they have with trucks, on, and I'm sure the public would be glad to know that they're keeping that up. Um, Mike, maybe you could, uh, I think we talked a little bit about it last time, but maybe describe our traffic unit in Ocean Township and its makeup. All right, we're, uh, we have a two-man traffic unit, and uh, we're basically administrative traffic. We are using the patrol guys more and more for traffic enforcement. Uh, however, we're more of administrative. We work with the township ordinances, uh, more or less the council or the governing body, and we work with, uh, along those lines. We are getting into the, uh, again, traffic enforcement uh, more heavily, uh, but again, that's just because of the traffic increasing in Ocean Township. Uh, <coughs> some of the other um, things that you did, and you, and you spoke of uh, ordinances and things, uh, I know it has something to do with if, if people uh, want to open up a new business, let's say, uh, and, and they want to do uh, patterns and counts and things like that. Maybe you could speak a little bit about that because uh, all the officers in Ocean, we know, are out uh, doing traffic enforcement as far as writing the summonses and things, but uh, you guys have some specialized tasks that you take care of related to that. We take care of uh, if there's any new roadways in town going in or any new developments, and for that fact, uh, any new businesses. If there's anything that has to be done as far as uh, traffic counts are concerned or traffic patterns as far as the flow of traffic, or anything like that, we actually get involved and work with either the business people, State Department of Transportation, as far as our engineers are concerned, as well as our governing body, the council. Okay, good. Joe, uh, how about Howell Township? We're a three-man traffic division under the uh, supervision of Captain Daniel Myers. Uh, basically, our tasks encounter uh, many roadside checks uh, with commercial vehicles. We also do a lot of uh, radar enforcement. Uh, we monitor these situations where people would call in and say to us that there's a speeding complaint on such a, uh, such a road. We would go out and investigate it and take the proper action on it. Uh, we also get involved in the educational phase where uh, we educate kids from kindergarten all the way up to high school in different variations of uh, drunk driving, of uh, pedestrian safety, bicycle safety, uh, school bus safety, and of course drunk driving. This year, we're putting on some big programs in the school. Um, any any ones you want to particularly speak of, or just uh, well, every year we do. Uh, we have just recently started a uh, a program in high school involving the MAD organization, where uh, last year I did a program called Up Close with Victims of Drunk Drivers. Uh, this year, I'm doing a program called uh, Suffering Survivors of Drunk Drivers, where I actually bring in people who are suffering as a result of drunk driving accidents to come in and educate our students. Uh, in the drunk driving phase, and it actually brings it up close. It's almost like the Sally Jesse Raphael show or the Oprah Winfrey show, but it gets its yeah, point I, very, I, very effective. I think I kind of caught a little piece of that. I, I think that can be very valuable. Um, Mike, are we doing uh, anything in the schools, or do, would we like to get more involved in it? Or? We'd like to get more involved with the uh, education part, but again, manpower uh, shortages. The, our juvenile division gets involved with the D.A.R.E. program, mm -hmm. and they do touch on the, uh, the traffic enforcement, traffic safety portion of that, as well as our crime prevention officer, Danny Smith. He gets involved with uh, a little bit of the bicycle safety. Again, we'd like to expand, but manpower uh, shortages. Yeah, especially lately. <laughs> We're down some people. Um, Larry, how about, uh, do, you, do you get an opportunity to go into uh, a lot of the schools or or do the uh, most of the local departments? Well, the state police started an educational services unit back in 1929. Uh, back in 1929, with more and more automobiles uh, on the, the highways and the roadways, uh, they started the state police started the safety patrol, and it has run nonstop ever since 1929 uh, in New Jersey. Uh, we have a unit of 18 members of the educational services unit. Uh, they go out to various schools, grade schools, high schools, colleges, and they uh, implement traffic safety programs. In addition to that, the state police is very heavily involved in the drug abuse resistance education program, and uh, we have numerous uh, drug instructors that, that visit the schools on a, uh, a daily basis. Let's talk a little bit about um, seat belts and airbags. Um, 
I think people are fairly familiar with with the seat belt that that's come in the standard core since I bet you you know uh, whatever year they made a mandatory. Um, why are we so concerned about this? Well, first of all, they they became mandatory July first, nineteen sixty six, and the reason we're concerned is because we recognize the fact that safety belts save lives. As a matter of fact, last year in the state of New Jersey, 80% of the people that were killed in traffic accidents had one thing in common, and that's the fact that the, uh, they weren't wearing seat belts. And we know that safety belts save lives. Uh, and airbags with a three-point seat belt uh, even increase your chances of surviving a motor vehicle crash. Maybe, uh, maybe you could uh, define three-point seat belt just for those folks uh, who may be watching and may not be well, The three-point safety belt is nothing more than the lap belt, uh, shoulder belt combination. Uh, we we c consider it the three-point belt. Most people would call it the uh, lap belt, shoulder belt. Um, and, and you spoke of airbags now. Fairly recently they've been coming in. Um, I want to ask uh, in a second about uh, expense and, and exactly how they work and stuff, but let's, uh, let's jump to the phones here because we have a call and I don't want to keep anybody waiting. Hi, I believe we have Jessica. Hello. Yes. I'd like to know why there are not seatbelts on school buses. Well, that's a very good question, Jessica. And uh, we're going to let all three guys uh, take a shot at that. You hang on uh, the phone for a minute and we'll see what they say. You still with us? Yes. Okay. Larry? <laughs> well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I, I believe in seatbelts on buses. I, I know that seatbelts save lives. And as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there's some legislation pending. If it hasn't been passed already, uh, requiring the use of safety belts on buses. Would that, ha would that retrofit buses, or is, is it probably no, Actually, uh, I think what it would do is phase seatbelts in. Rather than require the districts to go out and retrofit at a great expense to them, as they would bring new school buses into their uh, fleet, I think uh, the new buses would be required to be equipped with safety belts, and that way they could phase them in. Because I'm familiar with some of it as far as 1992. Uh, uh, a lot of them are putting the three-point belts in these smaller school buses that have a capacity load of probably about 20 people, 20 students. The, uh, the van? Right, the van style. Uh, as far as the big uh, buses themselves, uh, the way I was told was uh, they stopped phasing them out because of the, uh, they're starting to place them in the, in the uh, buses due to the fact that the kids were uh, jumping around the school buses. They want to try to monitor them and keep them in their seats. Uh, they don't want the kids smacking each other with the belt. This is why they probably weren't there years ago, and now all of a sudden they're starting to educate the kids more. We're doing a lot more as far as all three is educating students as to why seat belts are important and the use not to abuse them, and uh, we're trying to phase it through that way. But as of Kevin, as of 1992, a lot of them have definitely have seat, uh, the three-point belts in them. Uh, Jessica, do you, do you think that uh, school buses should have them? Yeah, because one of my friends, um, just fell off the bus and hurt herself when she was sitting down and we came to a bump. Oh, and she came out of the seat? Yeah. Yeah, that could be a, that could be a real problem. I think that's uh, very important and, and uh, we certainly uh, thank you for your thoughts. I hope we answered your question for you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Oops. We also have Charlie, I believe, from Ocean Grove. Yeah, hi. How are you? My topic is, uh, I've noticed that uh, people that are driving when uh, emergency vehicles come through, I mean, they, they try to race across the intersections ahead of emergency vehicles. They don't get out of the way. They don't pull over the side of the road. Um, I mean, anything is being done about this, uh, education, um, if these people get summonses or what. That's a, uh, that's a good question, and it's a, and it's a valid, I think every one of us has had that happen to us. Mike, you look like you wanted to say something. There's, about it. there's three new courses that the National Safety Council has come out with, uh, as long well with the uh, New Jersey State Safety Council. They're called CEVO courses. It's called Coaching the Emergency Vehicle Operator, and what it does is it gives scenarios to people uh, as far as the operators themselves, what to look for. In New Jersey, we have a current law in the books under Title 39, which is our motor vehicle law, that says you must yield to an emergency vehicle. 
There's two parts to that statue. One is you must yield by pulling immediately to the right, and the second part of that is stopping. Uh, it does no good for you just to pull over and keep actually racing with that emergency vehicle. We can only do it through education, and uh, it is a part of the new defensive driving course that just came out, and it will be mandatory uh, January 1st, 1993. Well, that kind of answers that. Uh, Charlie, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. Apparently, there's, they're trying to do that. Uh, I'll be honest with you, that's happened to me a bunch of times when somebody uh, maybe pulls in front of you or doesn't get out of the way when you're going someplace. Unfortunately, usually, uh, whatever place you're going is uh, too important to, to stop going there and, and deal with the uh, offender at that point. And I'm sure that's probably the type of problem you're discussing. Um, well, I, well, I've seen it. I, um where I stopped for emergency vehicles and uh, the other drivers were abusive because I was in their way. <laughs> that Unfortunately, that happens. Joe? Yeah, uh, Kevin, uh, in Howe Township, we take uh, enforcement action against these people. What, basically, what we do is try to uh, get another patrol car to uh, monitor the driver or the uh, license plate number if they can at the same time. And we'll call that person up and get them into headquarters and find out if we can counsel them as to for, you know, why they didn't stop or what happened. And, what the reason were, and if there weren't good circumstances, we definitely issue a summons to that driver. Right. Well, I think Mike and, and, and Joe <laughs> summed it up. They couldn't have said everything there is. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, did you have another one? Well, just a just comment is that, that I think that uh, people are really being uh, irresponsible and, and, you know, I mean, I just don't understand it. Why? Uh, what is it going to cost them? A, a minute at most, right? And uh, I think these these people just don't understand uh, reality here. And yeah, I they're think putting other people's lives in danger as well as their own. And also, whoever, whatever call we're responding to, unfortunately, uh, that's that's a delay of uh, of whatever number of seconds or minutes. And obviously, if it was them that was looking for help, they. would want it there as quickly as possible. Joe, I don't know if you... Yes, uh, Charlie, basically uh, people don't realize it until it happens to them. That's, that's the whole thing. Once it happens to you, then you start to realize the time lapse as far as the officer getting to your call. Uh, other than that, uh, people don't, it doesn't pertain to them, so they don't care. Uh, we try to uh, look at the other phase. If it happened to you, what would you do? Uh, obviously, maybe it happened to you where you might have had to go to a call. Uh, you had to move over for an officer to get the call. You have a lot of respect, uh, where some other people might not have that respect. Uh, we're trying to instill it, so th that's an excellent question. We're glad you brought it up because this way here, just talking about this here on the show, maybe a lot of people be re it'll reach a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your call. Uh, let me take one more before we. Hi, do we have Lou from Marlboro? Yes. How are you? Pretty good. How's yourself? Good. I have a question about uh, there's going to be a new commercial driver's license uh, coming into effect on April 1st. My question is the uh, enforcement of that uh, new law. Is it going to be strictly enforced on April 1st, or is it going to be leniency? Are they going to give warnings, or is it uh, you know, going to be really uh, strictly enforced? Good question. Um, who's, who's ready first? It's not going to be the death penalty for the first offense, I don't think, right? <laughs> well, I, if you're asking me to comment, uh, I really don't know. I know our commercial vehicle inspection team is participating in that program, and I know that they'll be conducting educational programs, enforcement programs. Uh, to what extent, I'm not sure of, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, so yeah, that's about the, the only thing I can say. Mike, do you, are you f the only thing that I can add to that is I know there's going to be courses for officers on the enforcement part of that, and uh, they're telling us, as far as the Attorney General's office, as far as the Division of Motor Vehicles, they're telling us April 1st it will be enforced. As far as the courses for the officers, uh, we're still going to have to have the training for the enforcement of that. You see, we're, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I'm sorry, okay. go ahead. But, uh, I'm in the uh, truck leasing business. We have a lot of drivers that are applying for this license uh, in the state of New York and the state of New Jersey. Yeah. And uh, quite frankly, we don't know if they're going to be able to uh, have the license in effect by April 1st. We were just wondering what the uh, enforcement is going to be on, if it's going to be, you know, if it's going to be strict or they're going to be lenient to the beginning or maybe a 60-day grace period, then uh, I, from what I see, I think, I don't know if uh, the police have been given that direction on that either. 
Yeah, Joe, I know you want to comment, and also, do you understand if I don't know how much of an understanding you have of a commercial driver's license statute or w what's coming up? Maybe we can explain a little bit too, in case folks don't know what we're talking about. Uh, okay, Kev. Uh, be honest with you, I really haven't been that much involved in it, uh, but I can tell you, an officer has discretion out on the roadway. Uh, if there's mitigating circumstances involving uh, DMV, I'm quite sure an officer would take uh, his uses proper discretion and. Uh, take each case individually. Uh, there's no such, uh, there's a law in the books, yes, uh, but as we know, uh, everything uh, is set and there are certain procedures that an officer must follow, but there is a such a thing as an officer's discretion. If there's such a case, like you're saying, with you have so many drivers that can't get trained, uh, what are you supposed to do? Uh, if you can't put them all in at the same time, we understand that. Larry? Well, I would comment that this isn't something that's happening overnight, though. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I know that this is something that's been phased in over the last 12 months, if not more. Two years, I think. Yeah, two years. And uh, it surprises me to hear that even at the last minute, there are still people scrambling to get their CDL, their commercial driver's license, when this whole program started to be initiated two years ago. Um, so I guess we have procrastinators out there, and, uh, uh, you know, that's just how it is. As I understand it, uh, if you do, you have to be retested in order to be able to operate a uh, any kind of large commercial vehicle. Yes, there's a variety of tests depending on t what type of vehicle the operator is going to handle. Whether the driver is going to uh, haul hazardous materials, and uh, and there's weight classifications. Uh, but uh, it is a commercial driver's license. It's a, as I understand, it, a federal driver's license, and this is to prevent truck drivers from going out and getting 50 driver's licenses in 50 states. You get stopped in Pennsylvania, maybe you'll use your California license. And that's the idea of the program. So everybody has an equal and fair chance. And if a driver loses his driving privileges, it's not just in one state, it's in all 50 states. Okay. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. All right, thank you. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Jack from Wall. Hi. I understand there's a, a bill in the legislature that requires everybody to uh, wear a seat belt. There's also uh, another stipulation over that the officers are now going to be allowed to pull people over if they're not wearing seat belts. How do you officers feel about that, pulling people over for not wearing seat belts, especially in light of the fact of the recent cases that have been thrown out for illegal searches and seizures? Okay, good question, and uh, we talked a little bit about that before the show, so now would be probably a good time to address it now. Well, speaking for myself, and I think speaking for the other two officers, we happen to be all for it. Right now, there is a law in the books requiring people to wear seat belts. It just happens to be a secondary offense. It's a difficult law for a police officer to enforce because of the fact that the officer has to stop the vehicle for some other violation uh, in order to f enforce the seat belt statute. It certainly would make it easier uh, to enforce the statute. It's a statute that the law enforcement community believes in. We take it very seriously, and uh, we'd like to participate in, uh, in more enforcement. We think that by making it a primary offense where we could stop a car, it would become probable cause for a stop, that well, more people will have a tendency to wear their safety belts, and therefore more, more lives will be saved. Well, speaking from the... Uh uh, as a state trooper, in light of the number of cases that had to be thrown out because of the number of legal sto illegal stops, doesn't that get, then give you the right to make more and more illegal stops? No, what you're asking me, if it's legal to stop a car because a person's not wearing seat belts, uh, then we could do it and it wouldn't be illegal. Uh, it wouldn't be an illegal stop. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, the cases wouldn't be thrown out. Well, there have been, as you, I'm sure you're aware, how many cases were thrown out of the New Brunswick barracks because of illegal searches and seizures. What I, my point is is that if you're more inclined to pull people over for simply not wearing a seatbelt, aren't there, you more inclined to uh, go through the whole procedure and have the illegal searches and seizures? Uh, I, but I think you're missing the point, Jack. What, what we're saying is from a purely safety standpoint, uh, there, there's no nobody can argue that seat belts s save people's lives and neither am I okay and if in order for people to comply with that 
the, the police stop them and either remind them or issue a summons if, if the case might be, then, then uh, I don't think anybody can really be against it. But aren't you also subjecting to the populace to uh, not only being pulled over for a certain violation, regardless, but uh, the normal police procedure of being pulled over? You're giving the police the more opportunities to do that, aren't you? Well, uh, f speaking for myself, I, I don't pull people over for kicks. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, we do that because it's it's uh, it's our jobs. It's just traffic safety. It's a safety issue. Uh, I'm I don't stop anybody thinking down the road what uh, where else I can go with that. Um, and most police officers that are on the road don't. So. Uh, well, in light of the uh, in recent things of the state troopers out of East Brunswick, that may may or may not be the case, right? Well, I don't know to what you're referring, so I, I couldn't really comment on that. Well, but perhaps the trooper can. Sure, I'd be willing to comment. Uh, I'm not aware of any problems at any one of the state police barracks, but I will say this, that a trooper will not search a car unless he has probable cause. There's something in plain view uh, to make him suspect that a crime is, being, uh, is taking place. Uh, in some cases, if it's a drug seizure, for an example, uh, the troopers are, are tipped off by uh, drug paraphernalia within the vehicle. Sometimes there's the odor of a uh, maybe raw marijuana. But the officer doesn't know that. When he's prepared to enforce traffic laws and to enforce the safety belt statute, uh, that's why he stops the car. That's his intention. All these other things are secondary. These are things that develop after the trooper has initiated the stop. Yeah, but your probable cause now becomes not having a seatbelt on. Well, we're back to square just, one. Yeah, just as it would be if, if there was a speeding violation. But uh, I, I certainly agree that uh, it's, it's high time people start wearing seatbelts. And if uh, we can do anything to, to stop that, then I'm all for it. Yeah, I let agree me, with that, too. Thanks for your call. Bye. Uh, let me take one more call, and then we have a... Uh, I believe we have Dave from Jackson. Hi. How are you? Guys, i got a little question. Um, what do you feel about people that are being, trying to become cops now? And I just feel that maybe some more college should be behind people before getting out to be a senior from school and taking a test and carrying a gun. Do you guys agree with me that maybe, you know, if you want to become a Fed, I know as a fact through, through friends that, who, a friend's father who was totally retired told me you need a college education to become a customs agent or whatever, I just feel that maybe what you guys would feel that if somebody's going to be want to become a cop, a trooper, whatever the case may be, shouldn't some more college be needed, a four-year degree and a criminal major before some high school senior could pass the test and get a 10 and carry a gun? I also feel you guys should make more money to take a risk like that, the things that you people do. How do you feel about that? Well, I'll, speaking about the money part, <laughs> I'll give you the phone numbers to call. Um, uh, let me let me comment for a second, and, and then let these gentlemen comment. Um, yeah, the average police officer nowadays is is much better educated than they were in the past. Um, that's not to say everybody who gets a college degree should be a police officer either. I, I've seen some people with college degrees that um, I, w I wouldn't let them carry a, a pen knife, let alone a, a handgun. Um, but speaking. Uh, just in the educational area, uh, from from the years I taught at the police academy, I was seeing uh, a much better educated group of people coming through, more people with college degrees, and even people with high school degrees, but were just better read, were, uh, and certainly uh, had their wits about them a little bit. Um, gentlemen, jump right in. Well, very recently within the state police, Colonel Justin Dentino announced that he would prefer that in the future uh, all troopers that are hired uh, have a college degree. Uh, what I'm starting to experience, I, working at division headquarters, uh, I encounter a lot of troopers that have bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. Uh, currently I'm working with a trooper uh, who is going through law school. So yes, uh, we're seeing uh, police work is becoming very sophisticated and we're seeing higher and higher educated people. Guys, anything? Basically Larry said that no. I don't have any comment on it. I'm just saying okay. I, I think it would only be an asset for the officer to be yeah. more trained. Uh, you also have to remember, um, Dave, a, l a lot of people who become police officers, uh, even with uh, 
uh, the minimum of education requirements, uh, that's a high